Hey yo, it's that time of year again. My favorite time of year. And no, I don't mean when we get one year closer to our inevitable impending doom. I mean it's time to count down my favorite movies of 2023. 2023 I thought was a fantastic year for movies. It started off a little rocky, but by the end we were getting so many bangers, I kept losing count. So much so that this list was actually very hard to make, like I say pretty much every year, because there were just so many great ones. And as always, this list is subjective, I probably don't have your favorite movie on my list, and you are wasting your life if you start to get mad at me for having opinions. If you don't like my list, make your own list, it's not that difficult. Okay, here are some honorable mentions, P please, please don't kill me. Yes, in terms of the Barbenheimer hype, I would consider Barbie my favorite of the two. But there's literally no reason for me to compare the two other than the fact that Barbenheimer's a meme. It's like saying you like Aquamarine more than something like Saving Private Ryan. Like, why are those in the same sentence? Anyway, yeah, this movie rips. I never thought a Barbie movie of all things would be as hilarious yet as mature as it was. For a movie about a children's toy, Greta Gerwig not only brings so much life to the world building, I love how everything looks so real and fake at the same time, you can tell they had so much fun making it, but she takes the themes of feminism and just makes it inclusive to everybody. It honestly makes me really annoyed whenever people say that this movie hates men, when it's abundantly clear that this movie is inclusive to men. And one of the main messages of the movie is how men deserve to feel happiness on their own, and they deserve to have emotions and cry. While also having messages about womanhood, and how women deserve to be happy with themselves too, and deserve to be listened to too. It really isn't rocket science to figure that out. Anyway, yeah, this is a wonderfully executed movie, so much fun. It's for everybody, Greta Gerwig has not missed. If you saw my TikTok on my honorable mentions of the year and saw Ferrari on there, no you didn't. Ferrari hit even harder on a second watch, even though it hit like a ton of bricks on the first watch. Michael Mann is a director I haven't seen a whole lot of, but I can already tell Ferrari is a welcome addition to his filmography, and deservedly so because he went hard on this. The balance between the conflict between Enzo Ferrari and his wife, to the actual making and racing of the Ferrari cars, was so interesting to me, and in no way did it ever feel totally out of place. The family dynamic feels just as intense as the racing scenes, and even at points, maybe even more intense? And that's definitely due to the performances. Adam Driver and Penelope Cruz deliver two of the best performances of the whole year, and it sucks to know that they won't get recognized at the Oscars. They're both so transformative, after a while you completely forget you're watching Penelope Cruz and Adam Driver, and they have this build up to them that's honestly just so quietly terrifying. And of course, the racing scenes. Not only are they stellar to look at, these entire scenes could be the car's perspective shots, and I wouldn't complain. But they're so shockingly gruesome as well. One in particular, you know what I'm talking about. It made me feel horrible. This, this honestly may be higher in the future. Bottoms, I think, over time is going to be hailed as a comedy classic. Not only for the fact that it's laugh per minute for me, but for the fact that it openly mocks literally everybody. You name it, literally nobody is safe in this movie. Despite the fact the movie does have a clear side that it's on, it still openly mocks them. It's hilarious. It's like I always say, Comedy 101 is take nothing seriously. 
Don't worry too much about logic. You're there to be a goofball, so goof. Bottoms takes this absolutely ludicrous plot and doesn't care at all what you think about it and just has all the fun in the world with it. The more I watch this, the more jokes I pick up on. I start to observe more from those stellar comedic performances from how they deliver their lines to their facial expressions. It just seems like every single person was on the exact same page. And I'm convinced Rachel Senna and A.O. Debris are the funniest people of all time. I honestly don't really want to spend too much time on this movie because, well, basically everything you heard about this is true. It's sad. Like, sad, sad. Like, every time I think of this movie and I think of everything leading up to those final 10 minutes, and then I think of those final 10 minutes, it just puts me in this indescribable state of depression. But the beauty within this movie cannot be understated. It's a sad movie, yeah. But it's a movie that teaches us that it's absolutely okay to let those emotions out and that there's no shame in it. It tells the age-old story of keep people close to you, as close to you as possible, but director Sean Durkin presents it with such care. He makes you feel like a part of this brotherhood with electric chemistry that you don't want to break from. Zac Efron gives his absolute best performance, but honestly, Jeremy Allen White might have given top two favorite supporting performances of the year for me. He is just devastating, and the entire movie as well is just devastating. I, I'm, I'm going to start crying again. I adore coming-of-age movies, but I feel like at this point the coming-of-age genre is starting to hit a trope. It's not something that I find blatantly obvious to a point where it takes me out of the story. It's just I'm noticing a pattern and I wish there was more maturity to be had. Director Kelly Freeman Craig brings so much maturity to Are You There God It's Me Margaret, despite it being a story we've heard before. But what I got out of it is it's a coming of age story about patience. Sometimes truly coming of age, growing up, maturing, finding yourself takes a while. Not just for children, but for adults too. Fully growing up isn't something you can force, it's just a part of life that comes naturally. And being patient with that might be difficult at first, but it'll all be worth it in the end. And I think that's something that anyone can relate to. And because of how that was portrayed, I felt so much not only for Margaret, but her mother, her grandmother, and all her friends she made along the way. And I very much felt for their hardships and their desires. Are You There God It's Me Margaret not only feels important in the coming of age genre, but above all else just feels wholesome. This is a warm hug of a movie. The exact opposite of a warm hug movie. I can't believe Scorsese is in his 80s and still making movies like this. Movies that are three and a half hours long, that not only zoom by, not only making every single second count, there isn't an ounce of fat here, but every single minute is an emotional punch in the gut. This is a movie that truly showcases evil with an exclamation point, and shows in explicit detail what the Osage people went through, and how the people committing the acts had zero empathy. Throughout this whole thing, Martin Scorsese tricks you into thinking there might be a modicum of hope lurking within this movie, but then just hits us with the cold, sad reality of what ended up happening. Especially by the end with that final line that just leaves a huge pit in your stomach. As you can guess, this is a grueling watch, but it fully realizes that it needs to be, and this is a story that absolutely needed to be told and Lily Gladstone is still my pick to win Best Actress. People have laughed at me for saying Wes Anderson is my favorite director, and I can understand the criticism that he gets, but I always follow it up with, there's quite literally no one who directs movies like he does. And if they are, they aren't doing it as well as he does. 
I think where Asteroid City differs from Wes Anderson's other movies is that he makes the setting the main character here. The city all throughout this movie is given so much death and character, and they're still given the proper Wes Anderson treatment. This movie even feels very meta at points, which I thought was such a breath of fresh air if I'm being honest. For example, one of the earliest jokes is just a sign that says, Ramp closed indefinitely, and it's a ramp that's not even finished, not even condemned. There's also a Roadrunner bird that pops in and out of the movie and even goes meep meep. Asteroid City is a lot quieter and surface level than a lot of Wes's films. In fact, I think this might even be his most quiet, but within that calming nature, it's very easy to tell that Wes very clearly has a lot to say about life and existentialism. Which is obviously nothing we haven't heard before, but the way Wes goes about it feels very thought-provoking and emotional. It's very clear that a lot of thought and carefulness went into delivering those messages. That you can't wake up if you don't fall asleep line is a line that honestly means a lot to me. As I see it as you can't truly find yourself unless you've given yourself the time to truly relax and process. And honestly, I think that's quite beautiful. And to me, it's a testament to why Wes continues to be great. Godzilla Minus One is one of those movies that had absolutely no right to be as good as it was. Normally, I'm lukewarm about Godzilla movies, mainly because I find the human aspects to be so boring, and I always just know what to expect. Godzilla Minus One plays out like a horror movie, though. As it should. It goes completely unhinged and absolutely destroys every single thing in the process. And you see all the damage. In gruesome, depressing detail. But what I really wasn't expecting was for this movie to be all about survivor's guilt. And holy fuck is it emotionally effective. The human characters in this movie are so interesting as they are tragic, I absolutely loved following them. And watching the main character go to hell most of the movie was so heartbreaking, but it leaves so much room for the ending to be completely emotionally satisfying. And it was. In short, I think this is one of the best franchise movies probably ever. It's a movie where characters come first and they make sure that they're properly developed and they make sure to make Godzilla absolutely terrifying. I loved it. Blackberry. Dude, Blackberry is already a lot, but I also feel like I want more of it. With all these corporate biopics you've been getting lately, Blackberry weirdly feels like a parody of them, while also feeling like it's not far off with how these corporate businesses actually act. And that's exactly the reason why Matt Johnson's script here is so sharp. It's easily the most entertaining movie of the whole year. We all know the outcome of the Blackberry phone, it failed, we have iPhones now, no one has Blackberries anymore, but Matt Johnson just goes so hard with this movie that the intensity just never breaks despite knowing what happens. This is a movie that just keeps going and going and never shows any signs of stopping, with every single person just being on the exact same page. Jay Baruchel gives his best performance, the way he's just able to switch tones with his character and just making it seamless is just amazing to me. But Glenn Howerton may have given my favorite performance of the whole year. He's so fierce, he's so funny, he's kind of terrifying, he's FROM WATERLOO, WHERE THE VAMPIRES HANG OUT! He's just the perfect person for a movie like this and every second he's on screen, he eats everything up like it's easy. I don't know man, I really love this movie, I'm gonna watch it so many more fucking times. The Holdovers is the answer to the question of, why don't they make them like they used to? With The Holdovers, they quite literally made a movie from the 1970s. Not only with showing the rating of the film at the beginning, not only with just the use of the film grain, not only with the use of the 1970s folk music soundtrack, but with the use of its locations. Anyone can just put film grain over something and say it looks like an old style film, but when I see how Barton Academy's interior and exterior look 
and I see how Boston, where I'm from, represent, looks, and how winter looks specifically, that's what makes The Holdovers feel like a warm and cozy film to me. It's the little things in The Holdovers that really got me. A lot of the time lately I've been looking back. I keep remembering how winter or fall looked when I was a kid, especially in Boston. I keep remembering old teachers that I connected with. I keep remembering how I viewed my old school. And The Holdovers somehow painted how my memories looked like to me on the film. It feels like a time capsule. And even though some may complain it's too long, for me it didn't go long enough, Paul Giamatti is phenomenal as always, and honestly I think he should win Best Actor. He, he's just he's just so fucking good at what he does. Divine Joy Randolph is an absolute scene stealer and devastating. She should win Supporting Actress and it's not even close. But Dominic Sessa in his first ever role, Honestly, he's the revelation here. The amount he does physically for his first role is just astounding to me. And his performance in the third act of this movie... Dude, why isn't he getting more love this award season? Seriously, why? Anyway, yeah, this movie's great. Bo is afraid is a lot of things. It's sad, it's funny, it's uncomfortable, it's anxiety inducing, it's weird, and I seem to be the only person that adores it. Ari Aster created a perspective on anxiety where quite literally everything is out to get you. And by doing that, he created one of the most mean-spirited and unforgiving movies I've ever seen, not only to its titular character, but the audience, and I mean that in the nicest way possible. There's no clear distinction on what's real and what isn't. Some say 90% of the movie is probably real. Some may say 50%. Others may say he never even left his apartment. And for that, we're able to be in the exact same mindset as Bo. A lot of us who go through anxiety or paranoia or anything like that seem to think of the worst case scenario first. There's no going back, everything's all gone to shit, but there's only one thing to truly bring us back to reality, and that's the use of truth. Knowing the truth of everyday life and how it actually treats everyone, and not letting your past trauma define you, no matter how hard that may be. Bo is Afraid feels like it needs to be tough on us in order for us to fully understand what it's trying to say. And while at the end of the day it left me with an indescribable depression, I'm still glad I stuck around with it. I hope Ari's doing okay. Most of you probably haven't heard of this, but I heard of this. It was made for me. Y'all need to stop sleeping on the foreign films. I won't spend too much time on this because the movie is already really short, there's not a whole lot to chew on, but Fallen Leaves, oddly enough, is maybe the most fun I had the movies this year. Oh, it's not an action movie, and it's not laugh out loud gut bustingly hilarious even though it is a pretty funny movie, but the tone of this movie is so bizarre and sad, but in a strange way very wholesome. But it was so much fun following these characters and seeing what this world had to offer. To put it simply, it's like if Wes Anderson made his own Love Letter to Film movie, but it's not derivative of Wes Anderson in the slightest. I haven't seen lighting and set design done like this in maybe any movie ever. It's a very bright movie, but all the rare for it? Every single frame is so interesting, there's always something going on in the foreground and especially the background. There's so many details I picked up on on the second watch, it was honestly flooring to me. There's honestly a lot to go off on, but it's kind of one of those movies where you, you kind of got to see it in order to understand. But even for as bizarre and funny as this movie is, it's still a wholeheartedly effective love letter to cinema, even if cinema isn't the main character here. Cinema in this movie is just a really great memory for how they met that gave them some bumps along the way and it leads to one of my favorite endings and final lines of the year. So simple, so charming. 
When I was 19, I entered a relationship that took a while for me to realize it was borderline abusive, and it left me with some pretty deep mental scars, and it just killed my self-esteem altogether. The great times felt great, but the bad heavily outweighed the good. The reason why I bring this up is because when I saw Sofia Coppola's Priscilla, it felt like a giant weight was lifted off my chest. It had been a while since I felt this heard by a movie. A lot of the time during this movie, I was Priscilla. I was as in love as her. I was as trapped as her. I was as manipulated as her. And most importantly, I was as scarred as her. And while it's not exactly a comforting watch, it's most certainly cathartic given what I've been through. Sofia Coppola gave us a perspective of abuse that's quietly horrifying. Immediately you feel uncomfortable, but you start to feel as manipulated as Priscilla, and it makes everything at the scene feel like a ticking time bomb that could go off at any second, but you forget it's there, and when it does go off, it catches you completely off guard. I feel like it's rare when we get a movie that's this honest about this kind of subject matter, while at the same time feeling like a friend trying to help you. And while I'll probably never get over what happened to me, it's movies like this that help me heal and validate my emotions. This movie taught me that I'm never alone and I'm stronger than I know. The final two are very interchangeable. I kept flip-flopping it and I know I probably shocked all of you when I put May December as number two instead of number one. It's been a great fucking year, man. It's pretty much a tie at this point for number one. I honestly couldn't believe what I was experiencing with May December. The first time I saw it, I went in completely cold, only knowing the cast and the director. And what I got was a disturbing movie overall, but something that managed to conflict tone so masterfully, I couldn't imagine the story being told any other way. In fact, imagining the story being played out in one singular tone just doesn't really feel right to me. It's insanely bold in that aspect. It has such a unique sense of storytelling that I honestly haven't seen many films tackle. And because of that, May December, out of every movie I saw this year, managed to make me the most invested. I've seen it four times by now. And each time, I always pick up on something new. And honestly, in those little details that I pick up on with each repeated viewing, it makes me view the movie in an entirely different lens. And whether that lens makes the movie more disturbing or even more unique, it still makes me intrigued. I'm always intrigued on Todd Haynes' commentary on sexuality, performance, and loss of innocence. I'm intrigued by how Todd Haynes basically made a movie that felt period-free despite taking place in the early 2010s. I'm intrigued by how Charles Melton can so perfectly portray a literal man-child playing a man whose kids outgrew him. Just by one look in this man's eyes, you can see the manipulation, confusion, sadness. It's like he's 35 and 12 at the same time. It's incredible. I'm intrigued by how this movie handles comic relief, keeping it tonally consistent but having it be so jarring, overly dramatic, but so clear on what it is you just can't help but to laugh. May December is a movie that I feel we don't get a lot of anymore. It's a movie that above all else feels daring. It's a movie that calls out not only us, the audience, but people in the film industry as well. It's a tough watch, but it very much needs to be. And as a result, we got something that I think is an absolute masterpiece and one of the very best of the decade. And we still got one more to talk about. When re-watching most 2023 movies for this list, I came across Past Lives again, expecting to put it pretty high up on the list because I had already loved it for the first time. But a rewatch made me feel like I experienced the movie for the first time all over again. All over again, I felt that love, that pain, that hopefulness, 
and most of all that relatability and giving us all those emotions through a story that's played out as simple and honest as possible and people have complained about the simplicity and honestly I don't understand why to me it is the simplicity that makes this one of the most engaging love stories I've seen put on film because that's what makes it wholeheartedly relatable but what I adore most about past lives is that director Salim Son gave this movie such a dreamlike aesthetic all throughout, giving Korea and even New York City a very fantastical look, as if the movie is quite literally from the perspective of your imagination. It's from the perspective of those what-ifs, and even though it gives the film such a beautiful lens, you still get a sense of what's going to come in reality, and it just gets devastating but it's a necessary kind of devastation telling us that sometimes no matter how happy the past may have been there are things that are just not meant to work out and that's okay you'll still have those happy memories for the rest of your life and you'll still be able to find happiness in the real world as well but that doesn't mean that your what-ifs and memories are invalid it's realistic, it's devastating, it's hopeful, it's comforting, but most of all, Past Lives is understanding. Past Lives, as cheesy as this is gonna sound, plays out more like a support system than it does a movie. It's something that exists to give you comfort and give you hope, especially during times of being brokenhearted. It's always important to cherish those happy memories that you have and keep them alive and for that not only do I think Past Lives is a masterpiece but one of the best movies of the past few years.